Having a good time today. Our next panel is ready. I'd like to introduce them. I'm going to go through all their names and give them a round of applause as they take the stage. We've got Paul Krutko from Ann Arbor Spark, Michelle Mueller from MDOT, Will Floss from Dirk, and Alex Carroll's from Maven Car Sharing. Give them a round of applause. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Uh, this is our last panel of the day, so we're the last thing between you and the reception that uh, Maven's going to uh, help us with today. But so, hey, so what we're talking about um, this afternoon is collaboration between the public and private sectors and what that means for the future of mobility. And we heard a little bit about that um, at the last session in a very... We don't have to do this, right? Right to the no, reception? No, no, no. We're good? No, because oh. we've we got Darn a lot it. more to talk about, and, and that's... That's the key thing that we wanted to share with you. Um, you know, uh, I, think, I think Allison did say in the last panel, which was, was really kind of key, that if, if you go to these kind of sessions, you get a sense that the technology is ready to happen tomorrow, but then when you talk to the engineers, they tell you, hey, there's a lot of things we've got to figure out. And part of the way they figure that out is by being able to work with the pr public sector, do pilots, demonstrate, uh, figure out ways to work, just like we heard about uh, with May Mobility in, in Detroit. So a lot of issues around that public-private partnership pertain to the cost, safety, and access. Those are just a few of the, the issues. So uh, we're going to do introductions, and I'm going to say a few things, and then uh, we'll get right into the, each of the panelists. So I'm Paul Kretko. I'm the president and CEO of Annabur Spark. Uh, we're a public-private partnership, uh, public-private university partnership in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that works with early stage companies as well as mature companies um, solely on the idea that they're going to sell goods and services to the rest of the world. That's, that's sort of our mission. So with that, I'm going to go down the line here, let each of the panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Hi, my name is Will Foss, and I lead business development partnerships in North American operations for Dirk. Dirk is a startup that is Michigan and Dubai based, and we use artificial intelligence to understand everything that happens on roadways, predict what will happen, and then inform vehicles of threats and risks. We also provide analytics and data to uh, governments and the road owner operators, like the Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, we have live programs in Dubai and in Michigan, and we're here to talk about how we build those. Uh, Alex Karras, I work for this small company named GM uh, that uh, actually created an internal startup. Uh, a bunch of GM executives sort of got together uh, four or five years ago and sort of reimagine what mobility would look like with the trends and uh, jumped online and that became Maven. Uh, Maven is our mobility platform. Uh, we do everything from traditional car sharing to supporting the gig economy, building the demand side of that equation, uh, to also now getting into peer-to-peer -peer sharing and building the supply side. My role is, is sort of strange. Uh, I cross-cut across the leadership of Maven uh, I take operational responsibility for our electric fleets and how do we deploy that. So obviously something near and dear to a lot of public-private partnerships that we do. Um, but I also, I'm sort of the city guy. I, I came from public policy and, and have appreciation and that's usually a two-way uh, dialogue in the sense of I'm there to learn from them and understand how can I build, uh, make a better maven, if you will, and what are the services that we need to be considerate and how are our services likely impacting them, um, but also giving them sort of insights into uh, how, how, how can we work with them, how should we be working with them, those sorts of things. And Nick, you need to keep the baby uh, quiet there. But anyways, good friend in the back who's actually a, a great guy who could be up here to learn about it. So anyways, appreciate, look forward to sharing some insights on this side. Yes, yeah, so I'm Michelle Mueller. Um, I work for the Michigan Department of Transportation. I do uh, our connected and automated vehicle program for the state, So, which is really unique. Everybody knows us for doing roads and bridges. Uh, we're very known for orange barrels in Michigan. Um, we uh, do a lot of maintenance work and things like that, but we are very active um, in the connected and automated vehicle space in many ways. So uh, we'll get into some more details. Um, we've got testing facilities, and what we do as a department is we really focus on deployment on real world infrastructure. So uh, the testing facilities have their purposes. They do a lot of great work. Um, a lot of things get worked out there, but then we have to go to the real world, real world roads and actually have that interaction with the infrastructure components 
And I know on the last panel there was quite a bit of talk about that, so I'm, I'm happy to share some insights from an owner-operator perspective. Um, we do a ton of partnership work, um, which is the reason that we are here, from very large companies such as General Motors, um, we work with them very regularly in the space, to startup companies such as Dirt. So um, we're not, you know, we're very flexible in size, there's no requirements based on company size, it's really around uh, safety and mobility and getting people home um, to their families safe and fast. Great. So, uh, like I said, a uh, little personal privilege here. I'm both a uh, moderator and a panelist. So it's weird to be the, the moderator and ask yourself questions. So I said, well, I'll just tell you a few things first, then I'll get into that other role. So as I mentioned, I, I'm the CEO of an organization that was set up to be a platform for collaboration between the private, public, and academic sectors. So it was very natural for us in about 2012 to get involved in, in pursuing those kinds of opportunities in the area of mobility. So just to give you a sense of that, what does that mean? Uh, what you see around the country is an attempt by many, many cities, uh, both in Europe and Asia and in North America, uh, to create living laboratories, if you will, using existing roadways, like Michelle talked about, in existing environments as places where uh, startups and mature companies can work together to work on uh, solutions to particular use cases. And I think that's what you're going to hear from us across the panel today, is that this is a lot about f figuring out how to solve specific problems that are business opportunities that companies can make money at. That's, that's a key thing. And create new jobs and economic prosperity for your community. So as an example, uh, my team is working with Ford Labs, Deloitte, the City of Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan, and the Transit Authority on a project to create a common data platform in downtown Ann Arbor. That data platform would collect all the information from those various entities that are providing transportation services. And that creates a way for startups and other companies to connect to that data to solve real problems. Another example, and I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Will talk about this, is we have a partnership uh, with uh, a cluster organization like ours in Germany in which we're bringing their startups and our startups and mature companies together to solve particular use cases. One that he'll talk about, which is specifically about uh, intersection sort of improvement and enhancement. The, the other one we're working with on that doesn't sound really sexy, but it's a specific use case, uh, is uh, uh, automated street sweeping. Uh, think about automated municipal vehicles, snow removal, things like that that get turned on in the middle of the night when we're all sleeping. Kind of an interesting concept, right? And then, you know, interesting, Mark was up, Mark uh, was up on the stage. There's a pending NOFA out right now by the federal government uh, in terms of the Department of Transportation uh, for their demonstration about automated driving systems. And what's interesting about the collaborative platform is that uh, two of our testing platforms, and I'm gonna show you one in a second, uh, M-City at the University of Michigan and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, ACM, the American Center for Mobility, are partnering with Detroit, and the idea is we would model Detroit streets on the, the two the testing sites, we would, we would replicate them so we can test in a controlled environment before we deploy the, the, the actual pilots that we're trying to do in a real world environment. And with that, let me, what I wanna show you is one of our biggest collaborations, which is ACM. They're gonna queue up this video for you and uh, you'll see it.
So this session is about how the, the private sector and public sector can partner together. What I just showed you is a 550-acre facility, which is an open source testing environment. Anybody in the room that's got a mobility startup that wants to figure out how it can work in a tested, a controlled tested environment and control your data, you can do it there. It's open source. It's not tied to any one company, but it's it's a collaboration with the private sector. Uh, Ford, Toyota, Hyundai, Kia, Subaru, Visqueon, Microsoft, Siemens, and AT&T are all the first set of partners uh, that are collaborating in the project. So I just wanted to share with you that the state of Michigan is the most significant partner in that and invested, well now we're probably in the $80 million <laughs> range in this project. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what it shows is that there, there's a real spirit of collaboration and it's what it's going to take to bring these technologies forward. So, so with that, I'm going to turn to the panel and, and uh, ask them to talk, maybe share a couple of their, their things they're working on that are representative of this sort of public-private uh, collaborating partnership. But let me start with Michelle as a, as a, from the governmental perspective. Sure. Yeah, so I can uh, share, um, I can honestly tell you that we do um, a ton. A vast amount of my week is spent um, informing partnerships, a lot of discussion around that. Um, it's not as easy as it seems. I'll be the, the first to tell you there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of work from the government side, and that's aside from all of the paperwork processes and things like that that exist, and they're new things. They're different than what we of government have done over, you know, umpteen years, and this is new technology, new stuff. There's nothing that we, I don't go to a handbook every day and try to get information or find information about how to do that. Collaboration's about everybody being in it for the right reasons and everybody bringing their parts to the table. Um, I am very happy to say in Michigan that our partnerships um, are not paid for. Um, and I'm happy to say that because every partnership we have, everybody brings their pieces to the table, including us as a owner operator. And we collaborate, we all talk, we have large discussions about what's our goals. That's really the first, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the technology going to do? And we talk, we talk through that and we understand why we're all in it. We understand what that partnership looks like. We define that. Everything's not on paper. Um, we collaborate and we figure out where's our challenges, where's our barriers, what do we need to get through those? And those exist everywhere. They're not just on the government side, they're on company sides, um, software and things like that. So, um, you know, a couple examples. Uh, one, which is uh, probably why we're on the panel um, together, is um, a great story. I love to share it, is uh, we have a very collaborative partnership with Dirk that we started with. Um, we are in introduced to them through our Planet M um, team, which is our mobility brand in Michigan. And uh, we had some interactions, we had some discussions, some questions, things like that. Um, they came back to us uh, as an owner operator with a proposal, um, which was great, we love that. And really defined what they were looking to do, what they could provide, and how that could solve um, challenges that we as an owner operator have in the space. So uh, we did a lot of work, um, to say the least. We moved forward, we did installation. Uh, we've got an intersection installed in downtown Detroit, and we showcased that, we showcased that this past summer at the ITS America um, annual meeting that was held in Detroit, and it continues um, to work today. So uh, we are in conversations actually uh, this coming week. Uh, we're bringing a bunch of people together to look at what we've captured, lessons learned from that intersection, and uh, I don't want to steal Will's thunder, I'll let him talk about their technology, but we've done a lot of um, use case analysis around what we're seeing, and we can actually use the technology to understand um, and really see from the visual perspective, it predicts a crash is going to happen, and then that crash happened. Um, it's looking at pedestrians, so now we're really evaluating use cases and how we can save actual, um, prevent crashes and save lives with the technology. We have others. Um, we've got some with uh, General Motors, and um, specifically, we're doing some work with them around, um, we did work around red light violation. So we installed a couple intersections. You may have read about it in the news. Um, and we integrated that with them from the actual signal controller on the infrastructure side into their vehicle. So they actually get that information. They continue to test with that. And we continue to evolve on that partnership. So I can go through a bunch of examples. I'm not just saying that. I could give you a ton of them. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that we do every day that we can't talk about with different companies. So they have reasons that they're not sharing those. And until they choose to make those public, 
we don't talk about those. Um, it's one of our respect things that we deal with right out of the gate in a partnership is until they're ready to talk about it, we don't talk about it. So um, I can so elaborate maybe, more. Well, yeah, so maybe you will. Why don't you talk about you know, what the project was and, and your experience in engaging with the state and the city of Detroit on, on the project? Yeah, so and I'll actually start by uh, hitting that part first. Uh, to be perfectly honest, when we started engaging with governments, we had no idea what to expect, and I think we expected the absolute worst. Um, and we expected this to be an extremely slow-moving process where we were going to have to spend months and thousands and thousands of dollars just being present and convincing uh, the government that what we were doing was a valid solution to a problem. Uh, I have congestion. They have things that our technology is designed to solve. And by making them aware of our capabilities, we were able to then say, how do we get this integrated into some of the initiatives that you have? Versus trying to do what I think a lot of technology companies do, which is say, I have technology, how can I jam this in there, right? So we actually worked with Michelle to say, we've got a couple of applications we're thinking about. Some of them are mobility focused, some of them are safety focused. And Michelle and the team kind of said, safety ones are really important to me. This is something that we're looking to do. It's technology that we have an actual need for. Let's start there. The mobility one, that's maybe later, but safety is our top priority right now and this is the type of application we've been looking for. So with that context, what we were able to then do is craft an agreement with the Michigan Department of Transportation to deploy our technology in downtown Detroit at one of the most dangerous and most congested intersections. So if you know Detroit and you know the Renaissance Center and you walk outside and it's to your back and you look at the Tunnel of Windsor and you look up, you're gonna see a bunch of cameras now on that intersection. We worked with the Michigan Department of Transportation to put those cameras out there. We're tapped into those camera feeds and in real time, we're reading and predicting everything that's going to happen in that roadway. And we're using that to determine when there are going to be risks or violations or, or scenarios that are going to cause potential crashes and near misses. And that allows us to then unlock a lot of value in the sense that we can start working with vehicles and fleets to onboard them. You know, GM's been a leader in connectivity. There's a way that we can start to integrate some of their vehicles to this program um, to be able to start to receive these messages and avoid crashes. We can also provide deeper context on the roads. So one of the big things that we focus on is what we call near misses. At some point, you will know that there was a crash. There will be a crash report. There will be an investigation. You'll learn the why that happened. What you may not know is how many almost crashes there were. And you may not know why those things happened. And you may not know if it's a systemic problem. And so we're actually able to now start tracking near misses and predicting when near misses happen. And then start to dig into it and say, well, why did they happen? And then we can do other things like understand traffic flows and congestion, tunnel usage and demand, right? And that allows us to provide a lot of information that's valuable, we think. Uh, to the governmental stakeholders. Continuing on that line, we continue to learn and partner with the government stakeholders. So some information that we collect, candidly, we don't necessarily know that it's extremely valuable to solve another problem that Michelle may have as the Michigan uh, road owner operator. So sometimes there's a problem that she has that our applications can solve as a byproduct of what we're doing. So it remains very collaborative, I think, in those conversations. It also helps us find other ways that we can bring these technologies broader throughout Michigan. So, um Maybe, Alex, you share uh, an example of where you've been interacting with governmental units to help advance your program. Yeah, I think what, what's neat here, and, and I'll try to complement what we're talking about, we're talking about, so far, sort of public-private partnerships from a technology deployment, right? How do we go do this to, to solve X problem? Um, maybe what I can share is, uh, it, Mark is, and I've been in the middle of it, is the opposite, right? The, the public-private partnership to solve the customer's problem, right? And um, those of us in Detroit know that uh, mobility in Detroit is very car-centric. And if you don't have a car, uh, access and mobility is, is severely challenged. So uh, you're, I'm going to screw up timing, uh, but you know what, what happened uh, about a year ago, a little bit more, uh, a lot of different stakeholders came together to do an innovation uh, sprint uh, with the city. Uh, DTE was involved, Lear was involved, we were in love, Bedrock was involved, Planet M was involved. Um, and that really was around, all right, we have mobility challenges in different parts, in all parts of our communities. What are the things that we can do uh, to sort of brainstorm it? And all of us embedded, um, you know, some of our key talent within WeWork, and it was like, all right, let's go figure out these problems. And uh, that, that project's called Project Kinetic, and what, what came out of it was uh, a handful of, of projects that were really around sort of this customer-centric, how do we go figure it out? And, and one of uh, the ones that Maven decided to take on was 
uh, a community-based car sharing. Uh, so think about the transit deserts that we have um, and really the lack of mobility and access in these communities. How could we uh, work with the city and NGO to start putting those pieces together? So we, we're, we're in the midst of designing that, and uh, it's, it's come with a little bit of challenge around, uh, I think, trust. But what, what has really worked out really well is uh, the city has found a great partner uh, in an NGO to work with Maven uh, so we can understand and appreciate what their local needs are. I, I, I often said if, if GM was sort of on the side of nobody would really care right and really care about this as a community asset and the NGO has the ability to do that and then we can leverage our platform the mobility platform that we're designing to really give people access to something that they otherwise wouldn't uh, do it and then what we can do is go explore all right somebody doesn't have a credit card what do we do there? How do we go do that? Uh, other things like uh, smartphone. Maven technology is based on the cell phone. It's, it's pretty seamless. You sign up as a member. You reserve the car as a member. You unlock the door as a member. You drive away as if the key fob is in the car. Um, that's a neat concept if you have a smartphone, which most of us do, but some of these community members don't. So how can we get into the community, deploy some technology, really serve the needs of, of community members? Uh, we're, we're designing it around initially some use cases related to employment and work, which is uh, another really key aspect of getting people from these communities to uh, jobs and really enabling that concept. But how do you do that? And, I mean, and that is, for, for somebody like Maven, it is sort of fundamental to what we're doing because we want to expand mobility. But at the same time, there's so much learning and there's so much, like, oh, gotchas. So as much as we talk about the technology, like, we didn't see that and we didn't understand that, it's as much as getting into these communities. And I always say the underserved represents opportunity, right? <laughs> if you really, by definition, it, it's a market that's not being served. So how do we get in there and really start to understand and design around that? So, so on that point, you know, one of the questions that we uh, shared with each other before we prepared for this, and then really, Michelle, you, you could answer this one, I think, um, is as a, as a, when we're using the phrase operator, owner-operator of the roadways, it, it, the, the promise of the new technologies that we hear a lot about is on the safety side. Uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, 35,000 Americans, I think, is the right number. Uh, die every year uh, on our roadways, and that number hasn't changed despite all of the um, new technologies that have been put into vehicles. So when you're looking at trying to partner, and, a, and the state has significant resources, but it doesn't have resources to deal with every problem, how, how do you look at this? The issues that, that Alex just mentioned, which are really critical to some, to many central cities, how do, how do disadvantaged populations get access? That disadvantagement could not necessarily just be economic. It could be have a disability or you're elderly or whatever. So when you look at that, are you are you more focused on safety or are you more focused on these issues of accessibility or, or both? Yeah, so I would say both, uh, most definitely both. Um, but from an owner-operator perspective, I would have to say safety is our first and foremost. We want each and every one of you. Um, I drive the same roads. I you know I, I sit in the same cars that you do. We don't fly over traffic. We don't avoid, you know, incidents or anything like that. So we want to get our citizens home safely, and we want to get you there, spend more time with your family. That is our goal every day. Um, but however, we do take a strong interest in mobility. Um, it's moving. It's not only moving people, but also moving goods. We move a lot of goods in Michigan. We have a lot of um, a lot of car manufacturer parts that uh, move through Michigan. They come from you know, different spaces and a lot actually cross our borders into Canada. We have to keep those moving. So we work very closely with our Canadian partners as well in the space. And you know, it, it's one of those things, um, I think an interesting thing that we just recently launched uh, and started awards for was the Mobility Challenge. That Mobility Challenge project had $8 million um, associated to it. And we took proposal, we'll, we'll fast forward through the process, we took proposals in from companies, and a lot of those proposals are around moving um, those, you know, who are in areas and environments. It's got veteran aspects to it to move them to the veteran hospitals to get medical care. Because uh, in some cases, they can't get there. They don't have other means to do so. Um, some is delivering medical supplies. So there's people who are at homes um, in Detroit and the suburbs of Detroit in those cases that can't get medical um, prescriptions. They have no way to get to those. So how do we get those things to those people? How do we give people a better quality of life? 
Um, there's a lot of people who have disabilities. You know, a great uh, example is really those who um, have vision impairments. So how do we get those people so they don't have a reduced quality of life? We want them to get to doctor's appointments. It's nice to say for those of us who have family in the area or around or that are willing to take us to appointments and things like that because we can't drive ourselves, that's not all the situations. And unfortunately, it's the majority of people have that um, challenge. So how do we get those people to doctor's appointments? How do we get them to the grocery store? How do we do that and actually give our citizens a better quality of life? So. So for us, it's safety, in all honesty, Paul. Um, I would not do us justice to say so, but mobility ranks right up there, and we're showing that and working with our Planet M team um, in this mobility challenge, and there's more coming. So we're looking at different things that we can do and different uh, solutions for the challenges that we have in Michigan. And one thing just to share with the audience on that, uh, the, the, the state, in terms of those challenges, uh, is actually providing, I would say, like scholarships to let um, early stage companies use the test beds uh, to get on because the, the business model, and somebody may ask this question later, so you have these, these several testing environments, what's the business model? Well, you have to cover the expenses on them, right? So if we're going to have early stage companies get on there who don't have the kinds, have a great, great product or a potential great solution, but they don't have the resources to pay for the track time, the state's willing to support that. Well, I wanna, one of the questions that, that we had it really goes both ways. So I'm going to start with our private sector uh, partners. Is you know when you're looking at uh, a potential market, um, how do you how do you make in terms of applying technology to a market? Um, how do you how do you what do you look for in terms of that market? And how do you evaluate which things to to spend time on in terms of the myriad of use cases that are out there that you both talked about? So. Alex, maybe you start and then Will can pick on up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, it's certainly, um, I, I want to say a loaded question. It's just, uh, it's certainly a complicated question. So at, at the surface, you're, you're looking for basic market dynamics that, that really support what you're trying to do. Um, in this space, and I think what you're hearing across everybody here, and you heard on the previous panel, is um, this is really about testing and learning. Right in in many cases in this mobility space and and all the other technology that comes with it. Um, so we're I, I'm looking for partners that I feel uh, sort of share that mentality of how do we go learn together? Um, how do we fail fast together? You, you use some euphemisms, right? How do we go do that? And uh, a great examples here. Last year we launched. Um, a small fleet of Bolt EVs in our Maven Gig service. For those that don't know Maven Gig, uh, we do short-term rentals uh, for those who are participating in the gig economy. So it's a commercial vehicle, all-inclusive. Uh, the vehicle, the, the insurance, the maintenance, and the case of the, uh, the Bolt EV, you get actually access to the prevailing charging network, which here is Austin Energy, plus EVgo. And so we, we in part chose to come here because the, working with Mayor Adler and Rob Spiller from DOT, like these guys just got it. And that open line of communication between our parties to learn in sort of real time um, gave us the comfort to be able to say, all right, they, they get it. We're going to share learnings. We're going to see what happens, and, and we're going to take it to the next step from there. So, I, I, you know, again, basic market dynamics have to sort of come to play, but also looking for partners who get that. Now, that also puts responsibility on the private sector. We have to give these cities air cover, right? We, you were, I just spent three days with uh, 30 mayors from around the country, and, um, you know, we were talking about sort of their short cycles, right? They're on election terms, and, you know, if Mayor Adler goes and does something that allows GM to go on their streets to do something stupid, right, in, in, in the public size, it, why did you do that, right? We have to be able to sit behind them and say, this is what we're learning, this is why we're learning it, here's the end game, and, okay, yeah, there was a hiccup, but that's w what we learned from there is where we go. So. I, I look for folks who have that mentality and who, who really want to share sort of this, this lesson learned. In, in Austin, for those who are from here, you know it, right? The growth is challenging. Uh, mobility is even crazier challenging. Every scooter in the world is challenging. Um, but now how do you start to think about that in multimodal and all those other really dynamic questions that I think come with it? How about you, Will? Yeah, so I think I would echo a lot of those sentiments, and I think uh, it's resonated for why Michigan was a first market for us. So as a startup in particular, our, our resources are constrained, right? Our time, our capital. And you could 
go down a rabbit hole of trying to bring your technology everywhere immediately at all the time first. And particularly when you're talking about a, a situation where we, we have dependencies and relationships with the infrastructure side of it, you're just gonna burn effort and capital, right? And so for us, it was really important early on to find the people that were not talking about doing things, they were, they were actually doing things. And so for us, the Michigan Department of Transportation at the time, I believe still true, has the uh, largest number of connected roadways in the United States. So for us, what does that tell us? They are committed to spend on improving the infrastructure. They have passed legislation that said they weren't gonna install or retrofit a, a traffic light unless it was a connected traffic light, right? Okay, so now they're committed to road infrastructure and they're committed to connectivity and they've got regulations to support that. So it's a friendly environment from a, from a what we do business model alignment perspective. Then it comes to are they spending money on these capabilities? Is safety a priority? If that checks, yes. Um, how do we know that? Well, they're committed to Vision Zero initiatives. They're committed to these programs to drive safety on roadways. And one of the things that I find every time I go to the Southfield office, they actually track the number of fatalities. And they track how they're trending against last year against those statistics. And Paul, to correct something you said earlier, yes, 35,000 is the number of fatalities in the U.S. It actually has changed. It's gotten 20% worse in the last seven years, despite the fact that our vehicles are quote unquote safer. And Michigan actually has fewer fatalities than it did at this point last year. So, you know, we look for a, a, a buyer and a partner that's got those priorities aligned with us, and then we go in on it, right? Then we say, well, what's the problem that we can help them solve, and how can we do that? And how can we grow together and build together with other problems that they can have? So for us, that's really how we prioritized it. Michigan, in particular, has been important for us um, because we've gotten the deployment in downtown Detroit. It helps us validate some technical things. We can now show this technology works in extreme cold, extreme weather conditions. We've got testing resources that are available to us. We've got friendly funding mechanisms with things like Planet M and MEDC. We've got talent access and resources. So that's all very nice, but it starts with, is it the right climate from a partnership and a business perspective? Yeah, and I think the, the thing, uh, having been involved in economic development for many, many years all over the country, one of the key things that, that's important for in a public-private partnership like this is how the, the local government or even the state government looks at the opportunity to help you grow your company. So the, the notion of a test bed or a living laboratory where you can demonstrate, particularly because these are, these are public kinds of things, how it works to other cities is really a significant marketing advantage. Michelle, for you, the same question, but the other way around. When, you're, when, when somebody's approaching you, what, what, are you, what are you looking for in terms of a private sector partner uh, to engage with at the state level? Yeah, so um, I will be very transparent with everyone. We do not take on every company that comes to us. Um, I can't tell you, honestly, how many I get a week. Um, in all honesty, some of those companies will um, want us to sell their hardware product, service, whatever it is for them. We don't do that. Um, we are very open sourced. And what we look for um, when I talk partnerships is what are our challenges? So I'm constantly reevaluating and revisiting um, what our challenges are from an owner operator perspective. And we don't look at just state roads, we look at challenges on our county roads and our city roads as well. And then look through and talk with the companies. What does your technology do and how can you get us where we're trying to go as a state? We understand these companies are in business. We understand people want to make money. We get that, and we're all for it. But it does have to be a partnership that's going to help us solve challenges. Now, there are instances. We work very closely with MEDC, which is our economic uh, development uh, brand for this, or um, arm for the state of Michigan. We are the only state that does that. Um, we are very proud of that partnership. I actually interact with them more than I do some of our own uh, staff internally on a weekly basis. The great thing about that is it's also the infrastructure technology perspective, but for them, it's the business perspective. So what businesses can we collaborate and what companies are interested in bringing their technology and or opening um, a company shop in Michigan, and how do we make that a very appealing uh, scenario for them? So there are times where um, we you know, spend a lot of effort in how do we actually get that company to open business in Michigan bring the talent, bring the um, you know, workers, employ people in Michigan to move forward what they have. So, so we look for um, a solid plan, right? So there's, there's a lot of plans out there. Everybody's got big dreams. Um, they don't all come to fruition. But what we look for is we have infrastructure. We're willing to bring our portion to the table. What are you bringing? If you're looking for us to pay for you to figure out what you need, and or how you're going to develop it or want us in some cases to develop your technology, we're not going to do that. 
what we do is we take what you have developed and what challenges it will solve, and we figure out how can we make it work and how do we bring those benefits to show those. So in the case of the partnership with Dirk, um, you know, from that initial project deployment we did, we've now moved on. We've brought in them to other partnerships um, to help solve some challenges there, and we brought others in to move that partnership forward. So some of our partnerships start one-on-one -on -one with companies. Um, we had one, uh, you know, our example I used with uh, General Motors. It was one-on-one -on -one collaboration, and then we moved to the next thing we were working on, and we had to bring, we identified gaps, and we brought other companies in to fill those gaps that were interested in partnering. We do a lot of work with the military, believe it or not. Uh, we help them platoon their trucks and learn how to, uh, how that technology works, both on a freeway with different military trucks, but then also cross-border. So we platoon military trucks between the U.S. and Canada, um, and we learned a lot from that, and so did the military efforts. So we are very diverse in the uh, entities, both from government and um, private companies that we work with to deploy that. So Alex, you, you spoke you know, positively about some of uh, the partnerships that you've gotten into. Um, so not naming names. Uh, what, what might be helpful to the audience is maybe you could describe some of the things you've encountered that, that uh, could be improved uh, when you're looking to partner with the government. And don't you don't have to name names, but describe some of the things you've experienced. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it, no, it's, uh, uh, in my experience, it's, it's a single issue. Um, in most cases, people will have their hearts in the right place. In most cases, you can solve for air coverage. In most cases, you can make sure it's a win-win between the public-private partnership. It's, uh, uh, and I, I, I say it lovingly and affectionately as somebody in the public policy realm, it's contract, it contracts. It, it's the contractual relationships, and um, we, we have designed on purpose, <laughs> uh, you know, public contracts to be very transparent and uh, very complicated and ensure that, um, you know, the, the public understands what we're doing, how we're investing our money, um, and, and vice versa. Uh, those contracts are generally not designed to be able to go learn and do things quickly. Now, it, we're creative, and we have general counsels that work around that, but usually that is at a very high level, and you have to find a way to uh, be creative there. Uh, but it would be, and I, I'm searching the world, so if you guys got a widget, let me know. Um, it, it, and most of the time, there's procurement thresholds, right? And, and so what we do is we write a $24,900 you know, contract, so we fall under that, which is not helpful. And, and, and also, in my opinion, none of this is really for money, at least from a big company. I think that's easy. We're, we're going in for learning, obviously not easy for smart startups, but really how do we design a contractual relationship where we can go do quicker and do it without sort of the threat of, of a lot of these things and, and do it in such a way where we've reduced barriers, we've encouraged adoption and, and learning. And then when we want to go to scale, of course, get transparent, get big, put all the requirements that we uh, as, as residents of a state need into those contracts. But I, I, that is my biggest challenge is, is just watching how complicated um, the procurement side of the business can become when we really are just going to learn. Right. So, but, how well, one, just one thing, if I could say to that. So, I think one thing that we have learned, um, and uh, and I will say, some of the the folks at GM learned as well, uh, is that in the partnerships, we have learned the more we educate those people. So, we have to understand um, that you know, speaking from a state government perspective, this is new. So, our attorneys that work, you know, for the state of Michigan, our contracts people, our finance people, um, all of those people who have done their jobs for you know, 70, 80, 100 years, whatever, um, they haven't dealt with this. They don't understand the language. They don't understand what we're trying to do. We're not building a road. We're not building a bridge. We're not building a watch. Um, they don't understand what it is when they read the language. So we have made a very strong effort internally when we do these projects is we sit down with them. So we stop sending emails. We stop sh sending volumes and packages of paper to them that they don't have time to sit and decipher through and because they don't understand it. And we actually sit down and meet with them. Um, so every project I do that we have some sort of, a, even if it's an MOU, is we get everybody together and we talk at every aspect of what's gonna be in, involved in that. 
Um, and we had to do that with GM. They had the same challenges uh, with an agreement we did with them. So we had to get our attorneys, you know, they were going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, those of us trying to do the work <laughs> said, okay, you guys need to sit in the same room and we need to talk through, you know, these four words that we seem to be, you know, disagreeing about. And literally that's what it is. It's four words um, that, you know, prevent you from doing stuff for, you know, six months or a year. So I will say that if you're trying to do it, be open, be very transparent, have the communication, enforce the people. They don't have to understand, you know, I always tell them, you don't have to understand exactly the technology we're doing. That's what I get paid for, right? That's what we have people to do. You need to understand where we're trying to get to and help me figure out and not, you know, disregard our policies. We still have those. I don't, I don't work around those. How do we make it work and how do we mesh it? And to a point where they're comfortable in doing it. And that has been extremely successful. Um, so I encourage you, if you're trying to do that, to, do, to have those conversations. Not to, not to jump on the bandwagon, but for us, it was extremely helpful as a startup going through its first government contracting process. And cards on the table. I think our first meeting with Michelle to introduce the concept of DERG was probably September of 2017. And by March, we had completed contracting for an extremely complex program. Um, and that was because in January, when we started to think, oh, are we going to be able to you know, negotiate on this term or that term, or what's going to be the benefit, or what does this mean for us? We had that sit-down meeting, and we went through it, and we said, you know, this isn't really necessarily worth us pushing on. There's no risk created to our business, and, and so let's just move forward with it, right? And same thing with Michigan coming to us and saying, well, what are you concerned about? Like, what are you worried that is going to happen, right? And let's talk through that. So it, for us, it worked very seamlessly. I mean, I mean that very seriously. I think it was September, and then contract inked March, on road in June. Or I'm sorry, on road in April, and then showcased in June at ITS America. So, um, we still have a tier one that we're working with that's taken us nine months to get the contract. Yeah. And, and that's it's just to jump in. Imagine a vision where six months turns into one month yeah. because we've we as state government, whether it's a city, have sort of designed a way to go make this happen more quickly. And, and that's the widget I'm looking for, right? And, and it's not a knock. And actually, I wasn't thinking of Michigan when I was talking. Um, it, but it, it, it would be really nice if we found a way to design innovation into our governmental structures. Um, well, and I think that's one of the things for folks in the room. There, there are communities uh, in the United States uh, around the country that have uh, that sort of facilitator role. Uh, because I think it's, a lot of times it's, I, I, in my own work, I talk about how sometimes what I do is you're like the universal translator on Star Trek. You know, what, the, the little badge that they have, that the, if you read the literature, that's what's supposed to allow a Klingon to talk to somebody else. And so if you can get a human to be the translator between business mobility solution and government regulations, you can make a lot of progress. And uh, many cities you know, have hired now sort of chief technical officers and people that may have worked in the private sector that know how to, how to do that. Well, we're, we're about 10 minutes from uh, closure here. As the, and I have questions, but is there anybody in the audience that has questions they'd like to ask the panel? Yes. Okay, so the, did everybody hear the question or do I need to repeat it? Repeat it. So the, the question, see if I got it right, is how do the, the panelists in their work use uh, designers and user interface types of uh, uh, professionals to, to enhance the work that they're doing? Uh, yeah, I think you're in a new world, right? You're, you're, you, you, I think, are helping us who have started to design these things to appreciate how to properly design, right? And, and so I, I think this is one of those spots that is emerging. We, we actually just walked out of the, the mayors, those 30 mayors I was talking about, and we, we, there was a session all about this, right? You have a 71-year-old you know, lady who you want to do a, like a permit online, right? And, and, and you know, 
don't put an app for it, right? It's it's or it is, and you have to do a lot of training and a lot. So I, I admittedly, I think a lot of it is sort of in its infancy on how do we think about these things. I think um, the project that I was describing with the city of Detroit and the community side of things um, is, is sort of a design sort of thinking approach to to getting where you're going, right? Is how do I design these things for for all community members, not just the ones I think are using my product right now. Right to really grow the market. So I think it's a field that we're going to get more elaborate with over time and really start to understand it. I also, you know, from my interactions with the mayors this morning as an example, but otherwise as well, is that they are starting to see it, right? There's a sense of how, how are we designing for the user, not that we know in the biases where the survey said this is who our user is, but really for design to, to, to include all users. Just from our side, I, I wish we had the resources to do as much as some of the other companies can do. Um, but for us, we are a B2B company primarily. You know, we contracted directly with the Michigan Department of Transportation, but we are a B2B company. We sell to infrastructure providers, camera providers. They sell this service and application for the benefit of road users and departments of transportation by that application. So we benefit from the fact that they have lots of markets where they're constantly learning from, and we can have those relationships with them. And so we have to be a little bit of receivers of information. We love research like Ford puts out there that we can absorb. Um, I wish we could do more of it all the time ourselves. Um, but being B2B lets us get around that a little bit different. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I know that Paul had talked about some of our testing facilities. So M-City is part of the University of Michigan, actually. Um, it is a smaller test environment if you're not familiar with it. It's really focused on um, lower speeds. Um, it's a much smaller facility than the video you saw of ACM. Um, they complement each other very well. We've always been asked the question, especially when we launched ACM, why are we, you know, why are we launching something that's a competitor to something we already have? And they don't compete at all. Actually, they have very different um, models of what they're testing. ACM, the one that you saw the video of, does a lot more high-speed testing, um, can accommodate freight-type vehicles and things like that. So uh, we do a lot of work with all universities um, in Michigan. We've got many, um, especially that are into the technology space. We're very fortunate of that. One of those that is very active and um, we do a lot of work with is the University of Michigan. So uh, they've got different uh, branches. They do a lot in um, aero as well. So actually our aeronautics, we have an aeronautics division as part of our uh, department and they do a lot of interactive work um, with the University of Michigan. So yeah, just so uh, I can amplify that. So um, the, the university has a, a very significant and longstanding uh, Transportation Research Institute um, that's, that's you know, world renowned and, and many of the companies work with it. The Tech Transfer Office is, is very aggressive uh, about licensing technology um, and helping companies get started. Uh, my organization was ultimately one of the reasons we were formed 13 years ago was you know, once you license a technology to somebody and you, they go out the door, um, how do you ensure that they potentially have the success in growing? So we're, we're an accelerator, my team, half of my team, that's what they do. Uh, and we're very, very successful at it. Um, and we bring various uh, help with uh, capital access, uh, with uh, specific grants to protect IP. So we have a whole uh, ecosystem that's developed around Ann Arbor. Um, University of Michigan to support uh, early stage companies uh, coming through the tech transfer process. Another question? start answering that one, and I think you probably have more to add to that one. Um, for any public-private partnership, in my opinion, to succeed, you need a problem to be solved, you need an agency on the public side that has to solve that problem, 
you need a solution provider to solve that problem, and you need a financing mechanism to pay for the solution, right? So for us in Michigan, we were the solution provider, they were the public agents. We had agreed that we had something that we wanted to do together. We had agreed conceptually with the money and how it was going to get spent. And then we were able to use the nonprofit sector, in this case, the MEDC, which is a, I guess a semi governmental organization, is what it would be, a semi governmental organization, as sort of the financing arm of that. Now, we were able to then look at sort of what the portfolio of funding options are from grants to other mechanisms. We were able to work with them to select the same thing. Same thing we were able to bring Spark to the table as uh, an additional financing mechanism from a talent development perspective. So we were able to look at the, the nonprofit side as a way to uh, play the financing role in our, de our development. Yeah, and that's one example. So I'll add, I'm um, actually sitting right behind you is um, Catherine with Planet M. So she can also, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, um, but she can give you information. They do a fabulous, um, and I'm not saying that because it's near and dear, but I'm saying that because they do. They do a tremendous job at connecting um, nonprofit groups, startup companies, and they have mechanisms to um, fund some of those. So they have a process they follow. Um, they publicly put those out and go through, and, and Catherine can share more about that. Um, but they're very active or very aware. Not everybody is a you know GM or um, a Ford or somebody like that and you know has potential um, ability to pay for some of it and bring that to the table. So in the case of Dirk, you know, they're not in that situation. So they applied, they were actually the first one that went through the, uh, the grant process for that and got funded. There is certain requirements they have to meet. It's not just hand cash and everybody walks away and they go spend it. Um, there's accountability that's associated to it and there's other things that go with it, but um, Planet M can definitely share. So uh, from a philanthropic uh, side, I think that you're right. And there's a, a wealth of well-known foundation activity in Southeast Michigan in general. Um, there, the I guess the way I would characterize it is, is that uh, many of the uh, older foundation entities, because we're talking about Hudson's and things like that, um, are focused on these accessibility issues, uh, the, the issues of how you help disadvantage populations. So the kinds of things, for example, that, that Maven is working on is, is an area that they're interested in. Uh, there's a recent new, new very large, well-endowed foundation uh, that um, uh, Ralph Wilson, when he passed, endowed. It's called the Ralph Wilson Foundation. It can only be used, his, his mandate is only Southeast Michigan and Buffalo, which was the two areas that he uh, made his wealth in. But they funded uh, parts of the ACM activity. And in, in fact, but what they're focused on is uh, helping us create an academic consortium so that research can be done on the site. And a lot of concern, which was talked about in the earlier uh, panel, about what does this mean for the future of work. And so that's, th that's at least the perspective that I know from my interaction with the philanthropic community. And may I add a little color? What, what's really interesting to me, we announce our peer platform, we go beta, we sort of expand it uh, late last year. My phone started ringing around uh, folks wanting to leverage our platform to add vehicles <laughs> to meet needs of different groups. So uh, I'll give you some of the use cases. I won't give you names, but uh, we had a rural community who has one train stop. They want uh, people to get off, and they want to go uh, go sort of explore our sort of little one stoplight town. Uh, we have, you know, maybe a little bit closer to, to the sort of the need side is um, community college would take cars, and they would give those cars to some of their best students to ensure those students were coming to class because what they were seeing is in the middle of winter, students would fall off. Uh, a union, a trades union, who would do the same thing with apprentices to make sure that they were coming to stay on a job. And, and the, the thought was there is, hey, we'll give you the car, but you gotta go pick up three of your fellow apprentices. So you, you get this access, you get this mobility, but you're, you're gonna be solving one of our problems. So, and, and this is all stemming from sort of that NGO philanthropic, how can we go leverage your platform that you designed for a completely different purpose to sort of solve these other needs, which has been a real fun thing for me because we didn't anticipate that, that use case coming out of it. So we, we started about five minutes late. So uh, is there any more questions that anybody has? Here's one right here.
Well, sort of shameless commercial on behalf of my organization. <laughs> Komal Doshi is sitting right there, and uh, we have our new employee, Margarita, who is from here. That's what they do. And, and actually, Komal's title is to work on mobility projects with startups. So part of that is you got somebody that you can talk to specifically that's going to help champion you and make introductions for you. And also, we've got a whole self, you know, soft landing environment for you as well. So um, Grand Rapids, I think it's Start Garden, probably has a similar kind of uh, way to help you with that. Uh, but uh, the parent organizations, uh, we're being real Michigan specific here. So you know, we're responsible for the Ann Arbor region. Um, the Right Place is a, a comparable organization in Grand Rapids. So those would be the connections you'd want to make. Start Garden in the Right Place in Grand Rapids in Ann Arbor Spark in Ann Arbor. I, it, fundamentals apply. Make sure you're solving a problem. Make sure it's abundantly clear within the first 60 seconds that you're either solving you know, a problem that spin has or jump has or the city has. And um, in this space, and, and, and defend Michelle a little bit, that we hear it a lot, right? Your, your story is a story that is, is a broad one, and it's no offense, just you hear a lot of these things. So it is as simple as what you're looking at a resume and it's 60 seconds, what do I have 60 seconds to do? And make sure you're, you're really saying, hey, we know this is a pain point, this hour we're solving it, and then you start leveraging yeah. the, the, the points. So, so with, with what I want to build on that is what the key thing that we do in our organization with startups is we take you through a customer discovery process that if you really don't have a customer yeah. or you're, you're replicating what everybody else is doing, we're going to try to help you figure out somebody that you could pivot to. So that, that's the main thing that we do at our accelerator. So the final thing I'll say is, and when you're getting resistance, stop talking and listen and ask them why they're not interested because it's probably really useful feedback. Um, and I'll give you one example. We had an application we absolutely wanted to sell to Michigan. They have somebody else providing it. So, okay, we're not gonna sell them that application, stop trying. So, uh, we really, oh, we'll take one more and then we're done. Okay, yeah. yes. So I just wanted to come back to your point, Alex, that, um, so I'm from a big corporation, 235,000 employees, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And um, we also, you know, if we have a common vision for the PPP project, then we would be interested only if it's a common vision between the both of us because our resources are pretty important for us. However, um, what we run into is that because some of these go, we had to afford the Department of Energy for six months to get the contract. We got people sitting that want to work on this project, they're sitting for six months. And it's not just here. I mean, we have problems in France, we have problems in Germany, we have problems everywhere. So finally, you know, our board members are like, do we really want to work on PPP? I mean, it ties up our resources for so long. It's perfectly practical. In, that is a fair point. And uh, those of us who shepherd uh, the good cause through particularly large companies, um, I, I would say you, you're spot on. But the truth of the matter is we're doing, for, for GM in my case, the things that they need to know, you know? It, Mary's not paying attention to all of these details. She pays me to do that, and it's a little bit arrogant, but that's what she's doing. And and it's my job to say, hey, the, this is why these things matter. Now, again, Nick, credit. I, I have a DOE project we've been navigating for two plus years to get off the ground. So the, the, this is unfortunately a part of the, the, the navigation, and if you're committed to the project, you got to stay committed to the project. Yeah, I right? guess there's a final yeah. word on that. The reality is that these mobility solutions are going to have to work inside the government environment. So um, what we need to do is just all, both sides try to work on that problem. Um, you know, the, the, there are ways you can do it uh, that you could model that, you, let's, as Michelle said, can you, put a, can, can, can you put sort of a red team together that gets together all the people that need to make a decision instead of passing it from one to another, which is what tends to happen. But uh, anyway, so uh, th that's my final word on this. Is that What we're talking about isn't some consumer product. We're talking about stuff that is actually out in the public domain. So I want to thank, help me uh, thank our panelists for... <laughs>
So I think uh, there's going to be a little room reconfig um, the, for the Maven reception. So hang on for that. Yeah, check it out. The bar is open. Enjoy the bar while we move uh, chairs around and all that good stuff.